Now, this week we start a new teaching series, and we're going to spend three weeks looking at marriage and family and relationships. And, and really, in, in a lot of the language that we use over the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about our spouses and that kind of things. But I want to say this right off the top, that everything we talk about in the next few weeks will apply just as much if you have kids or, or in the way kids treat their parents or our grandparents and, our, and those relationships because these biblical foundations, these values that come from God's word are, are desperately needed in our world and in our families. And all of this starts on the foundation of God's world. So we're going to do things differently for the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll have uh, a couple speak today and a different couple speak next week. And then in, in a couple of weeks, the last week, we'll have all of those folks back, and Lisa and I. How's that? Somebody needs to invent batteries that don't run out. Uh, and on the third week, we'll pull everybody all back together and we'll kind of do a panel discussion with some Q&A and kind of unpack some of the things we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. So let me introduce uh, the folks that are going to share with us this morning. You probably know them already. Barry and Amy Speck. Uh, in our church, Barry is a board member. He is a, um, he is a valuable, knowledgeable uh, grounded and godly man. And Amy, uh, many of you know from our women's ministry, Amy is a Bible teacher and a counselor, and she meets regularly with people in our church, probably several of you, to, to listen and to point you to Jesus. Um, I am th really thrilled that this family is part of our church, and we are be quickly becoming very good friends. So join me up here, guys, and... Um, Lead, I've asked them to lead us in the first week of this, uh, this series, looking specifically, at, I guess, at the purpose of marriage. So whether you are married or not married, or used to be married, or hope to be married, whether you're married and it's not going so well, or whether it's going fantastic, uh, these principles are for all of us. Well, it's awesome to be here this morning and to uh, talk a little bit about marriage, but let me just say right off the top that um, we both feel very inadequate to do this, and, uh, but we're trusting that God will take the various principles that we have here for this morning and use them in all areas of our lives. Amy and I have been married for uh, 30 years. And there's that lovely picture of us. We were uh, 19 and 22 when we got married. And uh, today, the, the principles that we're going to bring out this morning about marriage, these were things we did not hear anything about. And um, we're, uh, as Pastor Dave has already set the stage for, we just want you to realize that these principles transcend all areas of our lives. That even relates to us sitting right here, not only in our marriage, but also in regards to um, how we interact with our kids now, how we interact with our grandkids, all of the, it transcends all that. When we, when we got married, the culture at the time communicated basically to us a very simple little principle, and it basically told us as, as young people, uh, don't have sex, marry a Christian, don't have sex, marry a Christian. That, that pretty much was the message of the day then. And naturally, you would assume, we assumed, that if we did those things, the marriage would be okay. And we were wrong. And the primary thing of everything in this 
is that we're just hoping, hoping to uh, set a good foundation. So early in our married life, as Barry said, we heard the message, you know, just marry a Christian, don't have sex, you'll be fine. And, and when you do all that, you assume that you go into the marriage and, and things will be awesome from then on out. But we grew up very differently. And many of you maybe have heard our stories. We shared it here in church a couple years ago. I grew up, my parents um, came to know Christ when I was two years old. So I didn't know anything else except growing up in church culture and growing up um, under seeing what godly marriages looked like. And so I had a pretty good understanding of, of all that. But I also was raised in a, in a home where I, it was just my brother and I, um, in under the under the confines of, of our home and our, our family, pretty much I did what I wanted, like pretty much within the confines of biblical things. Like I, I basically got my own got my own way a lot of the times. And and Barry grew up in, in foster care. His parents were alcoholics. He got he and his brothers got taken from his home when he was two and grew up in various foster homes and he didn't come to know Christ until he was a teenager. And so we come, came into this marriage with just very different backgrounds. We grew up very differently. And uh, the way, and so one of the things that was very evident in our marriage early on, things we disagreed about, well, you'll see in this video. I love marriage. Marriage is awesome. It's so beneficial. So many benefits for a guy when you get married. <laughs> Like when you get married, you're a guy, you get a little helper in the car. <laughs> I love my little helper in the car. She knows everything about driving. It's very convenient for me. <laughs> but sometimes I get confused. See, I don't know how I get anywhere without my helper in the car. I'd probably be bouncing off trees and buildings and stuff, but she's there to help. Like she tells me when the light changes colors and everything, it's very convenient and helpful. <laughs> like it's green, thank you, Albert. Because I was confused, I didn't know. Thanks, Captain Prism. She's very helpful in the car for me. I always know how fast I'm going with my help. She lets me know. You know how fast you're going? Yeah, I got a speedometer right here, but thanks for the backup. That thing ever snaps in half, I got you to back me up. So, we grew up in the age of uh, no GPSs, we were using paper maps, and nobody wanted to stop and ask for directions, and I would be like, can we please just stop and ask for directions, and I would, but I knew, I knew, or thought I knew, that I was right, and I was going to demand my rights. And one day, my, my gracious and generous husband sat me down early in our marriage and said, you know, Amy, you don't always have to have things your way. And I can't say that I took that great in the moment, but I realized that I had a choice. And as I thought about it, I thought I, I either can, can be constantly going against my husband or I can ask the Holy Spirit to change my heart. I can ask the Holy Spirit to help me see ways that I need to change and grow. And so, I don't do it perfectly, but that's what I did. As Amy has shared, we, uh, the Holy Spirit began to work in her life, but also in mine. And we began to really uh, grow in these areas. But all of this is impossible or is only possible if we deal first and foremost with what is the biggest problem. And the biggest problem is we're all sinners and we all need a savior. And it starts there. Recognizing that we're in need of a savior, Jesus Christ is that savior. Recognizing that he came to this earth as a baby and uh, that he lived 
a sinless life while he walked on this earth and then one day died on a cross and took upon himself that punishment of sin that we deserved and thus defeating death. And so really the biggest problem before we go anywhere is addressing do we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior? Have we trusted in Christ to be our Savior from this sin? That's the first part. However, if we do know Christ and have a personal relationship with Christ, we might be operating under the false assumption that everything is going to be fine in our marriage because we both know Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that is untrue. And we need to be at a place where Christ is that center of our marriage. But how do we do that practically? What does that look like in my life on a day-to-day -day basis? That's something that's easy to say, and sometimes we're like, how do we actually do that? For starters, I need to love my spouse the way Jesus loves me. How, my, Christ has extended so much mercy to me in my own life, therefore, I need to extend that same mercy to my spouse. First of all, I need to see my own sin first, and I need to see it as worse. It's really easy to think about ways my spouse needs to grow and change, or things my spouse has done wrong, but I need to think about my own sin first and see it as worse. It's really easy, like I said, to think of ways my spouse doesn't live up to my expectations, but I need to be grateful for the things he does do for me. Having Christ at the center means we're both seeking to grow in our relationship with Christ individually. I'm going to be in the word for myself. I'm going to be studying God's word for myself. And also treat the other person, my spouse, with mercy and grace. Can two Christians be married and not have Christ at the center? They can. But that's often where disunity and disagreements break out. Because it's not the way God intended it. And so this morning, we just want to give you three basic biblical tools that will serve as a reminder in your marriage, how do we think vertically before we think horizontally? And just as a uh, general visual picture, that's why we brought this kind of a concept of we have all these books and I think most of us here this morning recognize that there is a myriad of books out there that are written on marriage, on this very topic. All I would like to illustrate for you this morning is, though, that our desire this morning is to give you just three basic principles that take your eye away from always turning here to what other people have to say or what else you might read, and I'm not negating the importance of reading some of those books, but primarily, it has to start here. Go to God's Word. And so that leads us to our very first point. And our first point, if you're taking notes or whatever, that would be awesome. Our very first point that we want to apply to ourselves and to our marriage this morning is you need to recognize that you have a higher authority. And that higher authority is the Bible. When we both recognize that we serve a higher authority in the marriage, that puts you both on a level ground because you're both desiring to submit or you're both desiring to hold the Bible as the ultimate authority in your marriage. Puts you both at level ground. And when we do this, conflict can be resolved. When we're both submitting to God, it moves us beyond what I want to then asking, what does God want? And in all honesty, on a personal nature, let's be honest. We're all about ourselves most of the time. But 
when we put the Bible as the higher authority, then it removes myself, and all of a sudden it's about what does God want. We need to bring this principle of holding the Bible as our highest authority into our marriage. And this will make the way for things to get solved, dealt with. There's a verse, and I'd like to draw it to your attention. It'll be up on the screen, Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things can be, came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. And so from the scripture, we just pull out what God looks to. God created everything. Everything was designed by him. And yet in all of that, God looks towards those that are humble, have a contrite spirit, and tremble at my word. When we practice this principle of submitting to God and his word, it supersedes our own needs, desires, and differences in relation to our background and moves us beyond our own personal preferences. It moves it away from the marriage confronting such issues like, well, this is the way my family did it, and this is how your family does it. It's not about manipulation. It's not about talking or, or bullying my partner into what I actually want. It's not about winning the argument or having it my way. In other words, we need to be constantly reminding each other that the truth of God's word is the ultimate authority in our lives. And so we're, when we're both submitting to God and his word, like Barry said, it moves from what do I want to what does God want? But how do we live that out? Again, how does this fill, go in my life 24-7 um, in my house where nobody else sees me? It, it, it goes something like this. It means we go where my husband wants to go first, even though he picked first last time. It means I'm the one who waters the lawn when I did it last time. Or it means vacuuming for your spouse just because you know it will make their day easier. It means making a favorite meal even though it's maybe more labor intensive because you just want to show your appreciation. It means joyfully entering into intimacy even when I'm tired. It means quickly asking forgiveness when I have hurt my spouse. And it also means quickly extending forgiveness when my spouse asks for it because, and not letting hurts drag on for days or, or giving each other the silent treatment or whatever. It means thinking the best about my spouse when they're struggling with sin. It means treating them the way Jesus treats me. So item number one, ultimate purpose or ultimate authority is the Bible. Number two, your marriage has a bigger purpose and it's God's glory. Your marriage, our marriage, has a bigger purpose. It's God's glory. Isaiah 43, 7. In Isaiah 43, 7, probably very familiar to you. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We were all created in his image for his glory. If two people under one roof lose sight of that bigger purpose, 
we will just start living for our own purposes. And then all of a sudden, war and conflict will break out. In our marriage, if we're living for ourselves, then it might be played out in some areas like this. How I talk to my spouse. And I'll pause there for a moment. One of the things that I have learned from my spouse is is even tone. I didn't feel like I communicated something inappropriate. But the tone in which it was communicated was wrong. So how I talk to my spouse, how I treat my spouse, why I get upset with her, maybe how we raise the kids, or what do we do with the money. These are all areas that will get misconstrued and begin to become battles if I don't recognize that there is a higher purpose to our marriage, and that's all about God's glory. We read in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, just a, a lengthy passage, but probably very familiar to most of you. So I'm, I'm going to read it all, and you'll, you'll see it up there. Um, Ephesians 5, verse twenty. Two. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having declared her by washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The key thing I want to pull out of this passage of Scripture, and there are so many ways to go in this passage, but I want to just draw out a a couple of little small things for you. Did you notice, or did you pick up on the fact that there's another character that Paul is writing about? And that other character is Christ. Did you notice that at least three times you saw the word as or just as? And did you notice whose name followed that? Christ. And so from that component, it's all about Christ. Christ is our reference. So let's just pause for a moment. We asked... Pastor Dave and Lisa, and we wanted them to to be involved, and we're graciously pleased that they were willing to be transparent. So we're just going to watch a little video by them. Okay, you go first. (laughs) Um, You want me to go first. However, you probably have a lot more examples of when it's hard to love me, how you have to choose to do that. Probably. Yeah. Um, I think for me, one of the things that stands out most for me is um, in parenting teenagers. It is no joke. That It is not an easy thing. And there have been times where we have been in a situation where we have a very different opinion on how we should handle something. And um, 
I have, I, we both have stepped back and said, okay, I will let you handle this um, when we don't agree with mm. that. And um, in, in my heart and in my head, I need to choose, I am trusting you and I am going to let you handle this situation. And um, in my heart, not sitting there thinking if we did it my way, this would have turned out very differently or if it, you know, things, yeah. When we have that sharp of a disagreement on what we should do or mm -hmm. what is the right thing to do. And probably with our kids, that's probably where that's come up more. And it's not yeah. that I don't, we don't love each other. It's just you have to make a conscious choice that we're on the same team and we're working together. On yeah. It. We may not be on the same page, yeah. but we're on the same team. And you've got to choose that. Yes. Right? Another example might be in something like the love languages, where we are completely, totally different. And, uh, um, and, and, and it's hard to, to consciously choose to love or to, to try. It's not choosing to love. Trying to, to express love in a way you'll understand is a conscious choice. And for me, I'm not very good at that. That's hard. It, it's a stretch for me. But to choose to express love when it's hard. Mm -hmm. So you see beautifully displayed out in that video by Pastor Dave and Lisa is that marriage can be hard. But the beauty of even this patches of scripture and even as they brought out in their testimony, <clears throat> choosing to love even when it's hard because of what Christ did for us. Because Christ is the example. And you don't, have to, you don't have to dwell on this for very long to understand how much Christ must love you and me when we know what we're like. And yet he set the example. And so therefore, husbands, we can love our wives in a moment where it is hard, when we're filled with the reality of what Christ has done for us done for me. Wives, when we struggle to submit, when we struggle to respect an imperfect guy because of the fact that we're not perfect, we can love them well when we remember what Christ has done for us. Because Christ is the reference point. And I just want to reread one verse out of what we just read from Ephesians because it often gets overlooked. But in verse 32, this mystery is profound. And I am saying, Paul, Paul is saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it, but did you ever think, because oftentimes when we've dove into this passage, it's always in an arena where the man might have the opportunity to nudge his wife because the pastor's dealing with what her role is, or it's vice versa. And yet it's interesting that in this little marriage section, God puts this verse. There's a, there's a reason for that, because God doesn't make a mistake. And the reason for that is that God wants to remind us that in our marriage, we are to be a visual display of Christ and his church, how Christ loved the church. The way I would put it is this way. You are a billboard. Our marriage is to be a billboard of the love that Christ has for his church. And it amazes me that God is using an everyday practical example called marriage to display how he loved the church. That, that's a little bit mind-blowing to me. But then now you understand as well why marriage is under such attack. And so God has called us called me to love and to live with my spouse, your spouse, future mate, 
just like Christ loves the church. And, and this isn't perfect. This isn't an Instagram love. This isn't something that looks good on social media all the time or whatever. We can idealize marriage like that rather than realizing that we're entering into an imperfect relationship with another sinner. And when we do realize that our spouse is a sinner just like us, that's really freeing. And it can give us hope. Because Barry is a great husband, but he's a terrible God. And sometimes we expect our spouse to be our God and meet our every need which no human being can actually do. And it's a terrible responsibility to put on them. But hope comes when I realize that we're two sinners with a greater purpose to bring glory to God. And that reminds me of the greater purpose that the gospel has in helping us achieve that. So we have a higher authority That's the Bible, greater purpose, God's glory. And then lastly, we need a supernatural power, which is the gospel, because we we just cannot do it in and of ourselves. This is more than we can do on our own. It supersedes the best intentions and efforts that I may try to put forth. And I don't know what your expectations may have been when you came and and heard Pastor Dave set the stage about this being about marriage. Maybe you came and thought, well, you know, maybe he's going to talk about the husband role or the wife role or maybe how to overcome conflict or what sex has to do with it and within the, the marriage situation or maybe something would be shared about how do we overcome this struggle Really, in all honesty, this morning, our desire is simply to provide a foundation. And that foundation, and a piece of that foundation is understanding that we we need the gospel. There are, as I said earlier, need-focused books. There is shelves and shelves and shelves of them. And, And you know, in all honesty, if you think about it, We know that marriage in general is under attack and in crisis because there are so many books being written about it. And people are being driven to to see what else and to read up on it. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a bad thing when that replaces you focusing on the main thing. And what was the main thing? The Bible. So imagine what this would do in our marriage, marriage in general, if we would learn to meditate more on the gospel. And so this morning we have to say, or we want to ask even of you, is the gospel dear to you? We have a book. This is actually not a marriage book, but it's a book we both enjoy that we use with our devotions. It's called A Gospel Primer by a man named Milton Vincent, who's a pastor. And I want to read you a quote that's from that book. It says this, When I remind myself of my sins against God and of his forgiving and generous grace toward me, I give the gospel an opportunity to reshape my perspective and put me in a frame of mind wherein I actually desire to give this same grace to those who have wronged me. And so therefore for husbands this morning, a question, are you gonna give the gospel an opportunity to reshape your perspective so that when your wife wrongs you, and she will, because we're all sinners. Are you going to allow the gospel to reshape maybe how you respond? Wives, we need to allow the gospel to reshape our perspective 
and extend grace to our husbands when he wrongs us, and he will, because he's a sinner, just like me. And so, in closing, you need to go into marriage, or you need to be displaying it, because remember, as we illustrated, you're a billboard. I can't help but just think, um, um, where was I going? I don't know where my head was going. I guess I don't think. How's that? <laughs> That's my problem. Yes. Not sure. I'm not sure where I was going. I lost it. It's what? Oh, yeah. Um, no, I just want to say, let me close with just the three points. I want to remind you again that uh, we have a higher authority and also a higher purpose and institution of the power of the gospel and these are foundational truths that we honestly never heard when we first started off in marriage. So when you leave today, we actually have a, a page of homework for you to take, you, but take with you. But please take it whether you're married or not, um, whether, whether you're single or not or married or not, um, wherever you find yourself in your relationships. Because this, this uh, homework is all about the gospel and how we use the gospel in our relationships to help us. And so don't get it lost in your car. Don't use it to wipe up old coffee. Just take it as you go out the door and take it home. And if you are married, husbands and wives, I challenge you to fill these out individually and then talk about it. Talk about how you can allow the gospel to reshape your perspective and how you respond to each other and how you, um, how you can grow in your relationship, remembering that we're both sinners and we need to see our sin first and see it as worse. So just before I close in a word of prayer, I would like to offer to you that uh, when everything is done, my wife and I will be here in the front. If you just want to talk or have a word of prayer, we would love to do that with you and uh, just have the opportunity to connect if you just want to talk with us up front here after the fact. Father, we thank you again for uh, this morning and for this beautiful day that you are allowing us to enjoy and that you have fearfully and wonderfully made. Father God, we, uh, we ask that uh, you will just take your word and use it in hearts here this morning. And may we just wonderfully not just be hearers of the word, but be doers and really apply these things into our future marriage or our existing marriage. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.